I just want to remind everybody to please mute your your speaker um, and, until at the end when she's going to open it up for questions and um, we'll, we'll ask you to submit any questions you have during the presentation to the chat window and then um, Lisa will be manning the chat and raising those questions along the way um, so that it can be interactive as uh, Deborah would like it to be. Um, I guess I'll get started if that's all right. Um, thank you, Deborah, for joining us. You're giving us a kickoff for our season. Um, for yeah. those of you who don't know Deborah, um, she founded her firm Pierce Lamb in 1980, working on a range of commercial, institutional, and residential projects. When the Americans with Disability Act became law in 1990, many of her um, ongoing projects and clients were required to adapt and upgrade their accessibility. So it's only natural that her ongoing residential work would begin to see the influence. Her accomplishments and contributions to the field of architecture, education, and advocacy for universal design are many. Uh, Deb chaired the BSA Small Firms Committee from 1995 to 2005. She co-chaired the Women in Design Conference in 2003. She served as a member of the AIA Advisory Group for the Small Project Practitioners from 2005 to 2010. As an educator, she has lectured uh, at Harvard and Tufts and other universities and many conferences across the country. Uh, she also launched design award programs to shake the bushes on accessible residential design and received a BSA MAAB award in 2009 for her home design for a child with cerebral palsy. And it was with this project and her own research on many projects across the country um, that prompted her to publish a book with Taunton Press in 2012 called The Accessible Home. Uh, she has since continued her practice and advocacy of residential accessibility architecture, speaking around the country, which I think I also meant. And, um, with that, I will hand it over to Deb, who is going to tell us how she has built her practice and um, how we can all begin to incorporate universal design into our residential projects. So with that, Deb. Thank you. Thanks, Alex. Um, good to see everybody. I still wish we could see a few more faces, so it felt like we were all in one room together. <laughs> um, and uh, so I guess I'm not going to give any names, but uh, <laughs> there you go. Hey, Anne, I thought I was going to see you here. Uh, uh, anyhow, here we are, and uh, somebody else is still waiting to be admitted. I think someone's taking care of that. Um, I'd like to get started. I um, wanted to give people a chance to arrive. Um, this is a, a pretty interactive um, program today uh, because what I would really like to do is. Um, is to look into ways of more collaborative work among us all. There are times when I get project uh, inquiries that I can't take because I'm busy. Um, and I think that uh, if we have a, a larger, um, really a network of designers who are conversant, fluent, and effective at doing uh, accessible residential design that, that will serve um, everybody, architects and clients. So that's really uh, kind of my ulterior motive in asking to, to talk to you all today. Um, so let's begin. I do a screen share here and So uh, we're talking about building a practice around, did I hear something? Okay, um, I'm assuming everybody can hear, this is working. So universal residential design, residential accessibility, I'm using some of these terms fairly um, fluidly uh, in this presentation. So um, I'll get to the reasons why. Now, why am I not able to advance the slide? Hmm. Anybody, okay. Um, 
I want to read this one aloud because I think it's important. Today's problems come from yesterday's solutions. So when we take our inspiration from the built environment and from codes, we might be losing some, missing something because they're based on the past, right? And so in order to think differently, I think it's really important that we try to look outside the box and go uh, get right to um, the facts, understand the trends, understand how population is changing, understand the, the factors that um, affect where people live and how people make decisions. And so that's some of my best inspiration, I think has come both from really listening to my clients and also really um, reading everything I can. A really interesting source of information is just Google the US census and see what the population looks like. Um, find out what's happening in your community regarding um, people with disabilities of all sorts, you know, senior groups, um, children's groups, um, hospital groups, to be very conversant with how people are thinking about their own situations. Um, so what is, I'd like to hear what does accessibility mean to you? Can we unmute for a minute and just do a little brain brainstorming? Aging in place. Okay, good. Other people? Being able to reach the things that you need. Yeah, good. Reachable. Not feeling special, but feeling a part of uh, everyday life as, as just everybody else. Normal, you mean? Normality, yeah. Yeah, good. Think about, this is just, what does accessibility mean to you? What images do you have when you hear that term? I'm, I'm gonna assume maybe the lack of answers is that maybe people don't know. <laughs> Could that be? Lack of barriers. Mm hmm Good. Uh, just wheel, wheelchair accessibility. Uh-huh. I think of ease thing. of use. Okay. Here, here's, a, here's a few other, other terms. I think um, welcoming is, is a big mm. one. I think when I started doing this work, I really thought of it as code compliant. I thought of it as um, all about wheelchairs. And the more I do, the more clients I, I work with, the, the more life experience I have, I see that it's really broader than that. Um, it means reachable, usable, really in the broadest sense. So how can we create environments, facilities, details that are really user-friendly? And when we think about users, we think about children, old folks, parents, caregivers, um, tall people, short people, um, fat people, thin people, strong people, weak people. So we want it to be visible. So if something is out of sight, it's not accessible because someone may not realize that it's there. So I just really want to expand their thinking today about what accessibility is that code compliance and wheelchair accessible is the tip of the iceberg. That people come in all shapes and sizes and conditions and, and we really want to expand the um, usability, functionality of, a, of the spaces we design, make it easy for people to see and to hear in those places. So um, a little background for me, I 
started out, as was said in the introduction, designing places that needed to comply with the ADA and with uh, state access codes. And so we had elevators, um, city hall, podiums and seating and a lift going up to the race platform is to have a, a new riding arena for a therapeutic equestrian program on the right. Um, and then also with residences, um, maybe people in my early uh, career were dealing with disabilities themselves, but I really wasn't able, to, I wasn't noticing that up until um, I guess I'd say my aha moment. And I'm not sure when that was, but I did break my shoulder at one point and, and, and started to realize, hey, anybody can be disabled, disabled at any time. And it became very personal. Um, and so now I see everybody has something going on in their life. Someone reaches up for a cup of, hey, Deb, would you like a cup of coffee at a meeting? And he, he hands it to me with one hand and his other hand is kind of uh, not really functioning very well. And, and, and then I can say, you know, what do we need to do to make it easier for you to, to uh, operate things when your hand is, is not working so well? So here we have uh, a bathroom for a, a couple where they, uh, they both had issues and needed to use bathrooms. So we, we plugged one into a little pantry. And then we have here just um, storage within reach. So uh, in my work, I started to see that uh, the profession doesn't really, uh, I think, get accessibility. Um, the AIA conventions don't have many products that are accessible. If you go into a um, hardware company and say at their exhibit, um, what, what's new in the way of accessibility? They often don't know. Um, and when I was going to a lot of AIA conferences and speaking to people all around the country through my work with the advisory group for small project practitioners, I, uh, I found that people were saying, we have the ADA, we don't really need to think about accessibility anymore. We're all, we're all onto something new, BIM and the environment. Well, accessibility continues to be an issue and particularly in people's residences, which are not required to be designed for access. Um, so I, I uh, launched an accessibility residential, small pro a small project accessibility uh, design awards when I was on the AIA and uh, Projects like this came out and I, and I realized that there are people thinking about this. And I think that single family homes are, whether they're architect design or, or homeowner design, they've got a lot of great um, kind of creative thinking. Um, they're lab, living laboratories for what works. Um, one man sent me a picture of his kitchen and all, it's like being in the cockpit of a 747 where all of the drawers and the shelves and pull out counters and, and extensions and all kinds of devices were just within reach from, from one place in his wheelchair. He could get at the whole kitchen. Um, so I wrote this book and uh, it still continues to sell strongly, but this is a, um, a review of uh, great projects that are, where I think the accessibility issues are thought through in a very holistic way. It's not simply um, a nice looking bathroom that has, has grab bars, but it'd be part of a house and how do you get to and from the bathroom and thinking through how um, all of the activities in the house might relate to what is going on in one room. And so they're very, um, very holistic and, and comprehensive. Uh, it's a review of 35 houses around the country that are designed with a creative architect and a, and a uh, responsive builder and, and a homeowner who is very tuned into how they need to do things. And so I think reading the stories that are in this book really kind of gives a, a very clear big picture of the field. Uh, it's like that, um, fable about blind men touching an elephant and saying, what does an elephant look like? And one guy touches the legs and says, oh, an elephant is really 
really uh, rough and someone touches the tusk and says, no, an elephant is smooth. And so I think in understanding accessibility in, in the broadest sense, it's really important to, to understand how uh, you know large projects, small projects, renovations, new construction, uh, townhouses or apartments, um, urban, rural environments, and various kinds of disabilities, blindness, uh, poor vision, low vision, um, hearing loss, cognitive decline, all of these, all of these stories come together in the houses that are uh, described here. Um, I've spoken to all kinds of groups and um, in each of them uh, learned a lot to add to my knowledge base. I think universities, um, groups of, of students in the physical therapy and occupational therapy departments have just, um, it's been very, that's been very rewarding. Um, uh, let's see here, looking at these, some of the others. Spina bifida conference and autism. I um, really had to inform myself to, to work with those groups. And, uh, and I think uh, one of the things I'll get to later is if you'd like to get into this field, I think the more, the more we expand our idea of where we can learn and what's going on um, that we might be able to share our knowledge with that, that these are all kinds of resources, you know, attend a spina bifida conference, meet other people who are, who are dealing with that. So um, who is disabled? Um, pretty much anybody can be disabled, right? Um, Superman is disabled. Um, and so I think if we also expand the idea of disability from say the elderly or people in wheelchairs, uh, we start to see that it's really the, um, the norm that most people, most families, most, um, most people have a friend, a family member, a colleague that uh, has some kind of a condition that perhaps makes, um, makes an argument for a different kind of living environment. And when we ask them how they do things, um, we're informed. Just a few interesting facts from the census. 26% uh, of people in America live with a disability. And that's two in five adults, ages 65 and up. Um, one in four women, two in five uh, non-whites, I guess, non-Hispanic American Indians, Alaska Natives. So it's, it's really very common. Um, are those all people with wheelchairs? No. Uh, you can see here on the left that 10% have some kind of uh, difficulty remembering or understanding. Uh, nearly 7% have trouble with some uh, difficulty doing errands alone. 6% hearing, 5% vision, and then self-care uh, is difficult for many people. Uh, something I'll, I'll talk about a little later is a, a project of mine where in a uh, renovation of a, of a um, facility for elderly housing, um, we were asked to simply modernize the apartments. And then in talking to the residents and, and the uh, staff about what people's conditions were, it turns out that about 90% of them have some kind of disability. Someone brings in meals on wheels because they can't cook. Somebody um, goes in for dialysis regularly. So when we understand that that what that there may be disabilities that, that are not visible um, initially, that uh, it really expands, I think, our, our sense of what we can do with architecture. So, 
I just want to give you a chance to read this. Or maybe I will read it. Uh, disability is part of being human. Almost everyone will be temporarily or permanently dis disabled at some point. 26% um, of Americans have some kind of disability and everything's increasing because people are living longer. So uh, to expand our definition, disability is a mismatch between the person and their environment. So disabled, disability is not really about the person, it's about the environment. And, and that's, I think, mind blowing because it means that we as architects can really um, address a very serious problem that's, that's um, that is uh, the environmental uh, supports that can be put in place to make make it easier for a person to have independence and comfort and safety and a long, long good life. So, um, yes. can we? I'd like people to just shoot out some names of assistive devices. What kind of what kind of supports um, can make it easier for a person to to manage when they have some kind of a disability. Unmute. You're wearing some, Deb. Pardon me? <clears throat> You're wearing some. Yes, glasses. exactly. Glasses. <laughs> Great, things with bigger knobs and um, larger lettering. Mm-hmm. Kitchen knobs yep. that aren't pointy on the corners. <laughs> yeah, mm-hmm. Automatic doors. Uh huh. Automatic yep. closers. <laughs> yes. Um, Read back devices as well. Wait a minute, I pushed the wrong button there. Am I screen sharing? Yes. Uh, no, I don't no? have it. Hold on, wait a minute. Ah. Uh, uh, uh. Let's see. Tell me, uh, would someone please tell me what you're seeing? It says you're screen sharing, but it's not showing an image quite yet. There we go. Okay, I probably have to stop. Oh, oh, no, it was there. Start again. Nope, it it did work. Um, what do you I'm, see? There was just a no lag. Image. No image. Okay, wait a minute. It, whatever you did before, what you did before was working. It just took a minute to come up. Okay. Um, I'm not seeing it, so wait a minute. It's starting to come up now. Okay. So there, there we go. go. It is. I'm scrolling through. Okay, so some assistive devices. Uh, Josh is right. Uh, glasses are assistive device, hearing aids are. Anytime we wanna do something that we can't do ourselves, we're using an assistive device, right? I wanna go down and I wanna go fast in the snow. I get snowshoes or skis. I wanna fly through the air. <laughs> <laughs> And so I, I think uh, assistive devices aren't really scary uh, projects, scary uh, hardware. They're, they're things that allow us to do what we can't do otherwise. They assist us in having a good life. So in architecturally, assistive devices are ramps, elevators, um, a counter that has space for someone to sit underneath it. Um, whether in a wheelchair or not, in the upper left here, second from the left, you see a counter that's a little bit lower so that it's a good height for the woman who lives there and uses a wheelchair. Uh, doorways, openings without doors. Um, you see on the shower on the right, the tub in the shower, we've got the controls are at the front of the tub, so they're easier to access, um, grab bars, and a lift in the lower center. So I want to talk 
now about some projects of mine um, locally. And this is uh, one here that um, the couple is named Reich and Jen, and he has progressive hearing, a vision loss. And uh, this is their front porch. You can see no landing at the, in the left, no landing at the doorway. Um, the stairs are all different heights, uh, four inches for the first riser and about eight inches for the top riser. Uh, you can see in the lower right, the side, the side of the property has all of these projections that come out uh, and create potentially a tripping hazard. We've got the AC condenser and the bulkhead and the stairs. And in the back, we have two stairs, two, two uh, landings and stairs. But a person has to go up and down the stairs a few times to get from one side of the yard to the other, one side of the outdoor space. So they came to me and they said, uh, how can we make the house better? Um, one of the things that we did was to rebuild the main stair of the house. So you can see, these are all before pictures because I haven't gotten out during the uh, pandemic to take any after pictures, but uh, the stairs have winders at the top and curved treads at the bottom that project out from the wall in this middle photograph. So when Reich is walking down the hallway, he trips when he's going up and down the stairs. If he's not paying attention to the number of steps before he needs to make a turn or where he is on the, on the uh, tread from either the left-hand side or the right-hand side, how wide is that tread in the lower part? So um, he was falling all the time. Uh, one of the things we did is to align openings so that makes it easier to go straight through because a person with low vision has, you know, if you have to turn a kind of 72 degree angle to get from one room to the next and you're slightly out of um, orientation, then that can make it difficult. People walk into walls. We put in chair rails um, around the house so that he has uh, something to, to trail with his hands. So um, another thing we did on this project was it's a cape. And so raising the, uh, the little gable dormers on the front into a larger uh, shed dormer, we're able to get more headroom um, on the second floor. Uh, here's another project for Peggy and Bob. Peggy had progressive hearing loss and was pretty deaf uh, by the time the project started. And what you see here is on the left, the, the old layout of the house had the living room and the dining room on the left-hand side. And then this little kitchen was a, a very small galley kitchen with an opening to the back porch, which served as kind of a mudroom. So there were hooks and coats and shoes and socks on the floor here, um, very crowded space to work in. And if she's in the kitchen, she can't tell what's going on in the surrounding rooms. And to go from the kitchen to the front door required, can you see my cursor moving around here? Um, required going out the door from the kitchen and making a turn to go down to the front door. So if she has a, here's the doorbell ringing or um, here's somebody coming in, she could really get very nervous because she couldn't tell what was going on. So one of the things we did was to open out the wall between the kitchen and the dining room to make a, a large island where she and her husband or friends can sit opposite each other because she would read body language as much as um, understanding what people were saying. Uh, and she'd also be able to follow a conversation because she can see who's talking. And that's one of the things that was difficult with hearing loss in, in a group of more than they, more than one other person. Sometimes she sees someone talking and she knows to pay attention to them. And then suddenly they're not talking. Well, who's talking? And so she really uh, raised my awareness of a lot of the issues that people with hearing loss 
face. So we, we put in a coppered ceiling and the picture on the right, you can see just the visibility uh, that we obtained by moving that kitchen door so that it lines up with the, the front entry door. So she can be in the kitchen and pretty much keep her keep tabs on what's going on around the house. Um, she does a lot of entertaining too. And so being away from um, the action when she was in the kitchen, say getting more butter or something, uh, she could um, she she couldn't tell whether people were were still in need of something. Carrie and Mark is another project. This is um, a couple. They lived on a second floor of a duplex and owned the building. And there, she was having some fainting problems, and he was having some old. Uh, sports injuries that were interfering with his functioning in his shoulder and in his knee. So he was starting to become very physically um, compromised. And she was nervous about um, falls, particularly in the bathroom. So um, one of the things we did in the bathroom is to uh, turn the tub into a shower. There is a curb you'll notice, but they said, we'll move out if we need to. Um, I couldn't get them to take the curb out. In the kit on the other side of the same bathroom, we just um, gained more space by moving the sink a little bit and uh, got a larger countertop and a little more storage underneath. So incremental repairs, incremental improvements, bigger medicine cabinet, um, more storage, we really made a huge difference in their lives. And we also brought the laundry up and put it in a closet. So um, as I mentioned earlier, there was a picture of tucking a second bathroom into the, um, the kitchen pantry, which is right here, the lower floor plan. Um, that had been a butler's pantry between the kitchen and the dining room. So they felt that uh, sometimes they both needed to use the bathroom at the same time or, or he wanted to allow her to take a long shower and not feel interfered with if he needed to use the bathroom or wash his hands. Here's another project, um, a couple uh, living with his Parkinson's uh, diagnosis. They have this house, this old farmhouse, vintage 1965 or so, um, on a large plot of land in Lincoln and uh, the, they parked across um, a small yard from the house, about a hundred feet away. And the bedrooms were upstairs and the house was kind of a split level so that you can see in the plan, the area that's shaded is on an upper level and then two steps down um, are the other living spaces. And they first came to me because Peter wanted to put another bathroom upstairs right next to his own bathroom. And I said, uh, let's get you on the first floor and let's make um, the first floor safer and, and fully accessible to you. And uh, he, they really resisted because for him, his, uh, his mobility was part of his identity and he didn't wanna give that up. Um, but I gotta say, I wish they'd started a little sooner. He fell down the stairs in the middle of construction and was in the hospital with uh, water on the brain. Um, what we did for them was to add a garage attached to the house and a small transitional space that includes a mudroom and allowed us to expand the existing bathroom to make it fully accessible and put a bedroom on the first floor. There was a room in the old plan that was just too small uh, for, for him to use and then a walk-in closet. And um, on the upper level, we put another bathroom because one of the issues with Parkinson's is, is that sometimes he needs to go quickly and getting from one end of the house to the other takes time. So this is a second half bathroom with a little shower off of it. So his wife can use these if he's um, occupied in that bathroom. And then if he's in his study, um, or watching the game on TV, he has a bathroom that's very close. So um, that's that. Here's another project. Um, it's a couple uh, looking at um, just aging and they um, 
They had this bedroom. They had a study on the first floor next to a bathroom. And we connected the study to the bathroom and turned it into a bedroom. So with a, um, they're using it as a study for now, but it, it would become a bedroom when they needed it. But the whole idea of just shortening that path of travel and um, we, we turned the tub into a shower. We kept the toilet straight up opposite the doorway. So we have easy access to it. We kept the door off the hallway. I think we're seeing on the right a few ways of furnishing that space. And then um, uh, the sink on the right um, of the doorway. So just by locating the doors properly, we were able to maximize the maneuvering space around the, the plumbing fixtures. Here's another project. This is a, a woman who has a two family um, duplex. Uh, the unit in the back was very small, um, knee wall space on the second floor, um, a tiny porch that was closed in as a den. And in the floor plans, the rear of the building, the rear unit is shown in light gray and the front unit is shown in kind of a warm gray. So the goals were to make the stairs better. You can see this little stair, very, very steep. It was uh, 10 inch risers and eight inch treads, just really tiny and winders. And also to get a bathroom on the first floor, which was there wasn't, and a room that could be used as a bedroom and still have some living space. Uh, so what we did for her is to expand that old porch to create a new living space to to use that porch really for a new bathroom with a laundry in it and to create a, um, a larger living and dining space so that there was, um, if she were sleeping on the first floor, she wouldn't feel uh, compromised in the rest of the use of the house. Um, one of the, the nice features about a, a two family is that it gives someone options for aging so that people can have say live in caregiver in one of the units or have family move into one of the units and they can live in the more accessible. So little details here, no, no steps between the um, outdoor space and the indoor space. The porch was designed with the thought of where a ramp would fit in the future. Um, another project was um, I consulted to Tice Design uh, Associates on the shelter for homeless veterans. There, there are, it's a building downtown on Court Street where most of the upper floors were um, simple bedrooms. People would be coming in a transitional basis and sleeping there, eating, using the common facilities for kitchens and bathrooms. And they realized that uh, many people were really not able to leave and live on their own. And they needed to create some uh, apartments within this that would be um, allow people to, to live more independently. So um, I developed these floor plans that um, were implemented in the project. Um, didn't have to comply with ADA but or with MAB, but it was really understanding the, the different kinds of conditions that people live with. Um, many of the veterans have um, emotional um, brain injury and not all are in wheelchairs, but we figured that people would have wheelchair guests, wheelchair users as guests because they're all part of the same building. Uh, here's another one. Uh, I mentioned briefly earlier that this uh, is a housing mod modernization program that started out as uh, an effort to replace um, broken cabinets and countertops and, uh, re you know, re retile bathrooms and fix plumbing leaks and things like that. And it really turned into a, um, a much more extensive project. The, the housing authority went back to the state and got a little extra funding. And we said, how can you make your basic bathroom, which you see here on the left, um, tiny corner sink, tub and toilet, into something that's a little more usable. So we were able to gain more maneuvering space around the um, toilet for assisted 
use or someone who has a walker or some kind of a um, uh, perhaps perhaps a cane. And we had uh, curbless showers. We were able to get more storage, more counter counter surface, and um, we gave them a couple of options. And um, that's being implemented now. So. Do you think that there are extra skill sets beyond the usual, or what what skill sets does this kind of work require? Um, what's kind of, how do we need to stretch to get into this kind of work? Uh, I welcome suggestions. Definitely empathy, being able to imagine what it's like for someone else. Mm, good, Rick, excellent, yeah. To, to listen what people's needs are and to observe what they really need. Yep. Um, curiosity, I think, is a really big one. Um, how do people do things when they can't manage um, as they used to, or perhaps as we do, right? Um, how, how often have you had a conversation about how somebody um, bathes themselves, how somebody toilets themselves, how they brush their teeth, how do they get snacks, how do they do the laundry? Um, I think it's really important not to take anything for granted, to understand, and I say humility is big, that what we think we, there's so much that we think we know, we don't. And when we really open ourselves to um, all that's that our clients can teach us, um, then I think we're, we're be better able to serve them. I think team building is an important one because it, it may be that there are others that need to, to be brought in early, you know, the elevator or lift um, manufacturer or supplier. Um, physical therapists, um, occupational therapists. Um, I, I found also patience is big. And if I'll say to a client, well, can you go out and take a look at some refrigerators and tell me what you like? Um, that can take forever. Um, person may have difficulty moving around. Maybe there's a big family. They've got to find the time to do it. So um, in, in addition to the usual, um, I think, Programming is a, a really important part of this kind of work. And when a client says, well, we need a family room or we need a master suite or we, we need to upgrade our, our bathrooms, um, listening to why they think they need to do that, what alternatives um, they're willing to consider, um, what drives their project, where they think they, um, who else uses the, the project? How do they use it? How do they entertain? How do they, what do they like to do as a family? I think we need to just kind of expand our conversation and make sure that we really um, don't short circuit that important process um, because we think we know what, what the answer will, will be in the end, right? It's very easy to, to imagine that um, in a particular neighborhood that what people want is what their neighbors have, for instance, or maybe what we've done in the past and they see on our website and in our experience. So if we can come to each project with a really open mind and uh, listen, ask questions and listen, I think we're better able to serve our clients. Um, the more we can gain empathy, the more we can experience um, the world the way our clients do. Uh, I think it enriches our own ability to help them. If you ever go to Montreal or Toronto, there's this, a restaurant called Au Noir where um, it's all dark and the servers are all blind people. Um, Dialogue in the Dark is a traveling show that simulates the experience of uh, traveling through the city um, using a walking cane and your ears. And uh, it's really um, 
a really wonderful experience if you have a chance to do it. I did it in New York uh, several years ago. This organization travels uh, from city to city. So hopefully they'll come to Boston at some point. Uh, within the first few minutes of using a white cane and, and kind of feeling the uh, simulations for their trees and there's park benches and their trash cans. And um, I was a bit panicked because you really, you, you, uh, you do believe you're blind. And walking across the street with the sounds of traffic outside was um, frightening. And then I realized I could tune everything out and hear the voice of the person who said, it's safe to pass. And I could hear the sound of the, of the, um, the, the signal, the way it changed um, to signify that, that this, it was, um, that the cars had a red light. Uh, expand our consultant team, um, get to meet some of these uh, other people who, who really help people advise, advise them about their homes. Uh, and then I think whenever we can um, avoid stairs, um, think about safety, not just, uh, not just current materials, but uh, how can we make it easier to see? How can we make it easier to um, have storage where we need it? Uh, utility rooms, I think are really important and uh, mud rooms, laundry rooms, um, storage rooms, dressing rooms. Rethink everything. You know, just the old closets maybe don't work for everybody. Think about the doors differently. Think about how, how items are stored. And uh, lighting and acoustics are really big because uh, when people can't see or hear very well, they really rely on um, using the senses they have to the maximum. Um, I find storage is always uh, kind of an afterthought and it needs to be front and center on our thinking. Um, think about bedrooms, emergency access, egress is really important. And this is a Frank Lloyd Wright building on the left, but you can see there's this little desk in the bedroom and it has a, um, a thin panel that opens up like a, a, a window covering and uh, allows them to see who's outside. So attention to detail, color, color contrast, um, kitchen, hardware, um, cabinets. And uh, I think it's just as important to understand what people can do and to be making places where they can uh, live there do their hobbies and their activities that, that make life worth living. And um, there's just, there's such an opportunity for creativity when we think about um, the needs of our clients. So we reframe disability and uh, reframe access. This is, this is a wonderful project where the floor moves instead of uh, the person going from room to room. Not that we can all do that, but um, Rem Coolhouse could. And uh, normalizing disability so that perhaps the able-bodied people need to experience um, their experiences is secondary to moving people with disabilities through a space. So um, and uh, so I think this is my last slide, but uh, we have the ability to really change people's lives with our work and to provide uh, to, to really be very healing and to create healing environments where people can um, be as independent as um, they like. And it really saves money in the long run because when you think about um, the cost of moving to assisted living or, or nursing care, uh, that just if we have to, uh, sell the idea of making an accessible home to our clients. I think we need to understand that um, that uh, the fallback of using a nursing home is just gonna make it much more expensive. 
So um, that is the end. And I, um, if anybody's interested in in um, referrals from me, um, because I'm sort of in this process of, uh, I gotta say, thinking that I'll be retired in a few years, um, but also in collaborating, I'm happy to consult and to um, support you in your projects however I can. Um, you know, this is important work. And we're really seeing that, that the conversation is changing and that many more um, people are understanding the importance of creating accessible homes. That's it. I, any questions, any comments, anything you'd like to talk about from this? Um, I have Jeff. one. Uh, can you hear me okay? Yeah. Okay. Have you uh, done any design work or know of any design work that's been done for people on the autism spectrum, including Asperger's syndrome? Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. There's a great book by Sherry Ar Cheryl Aronson, A-H-R-E-N, I think it's S-O-N. Ar Aronson, A-H-R-E-N-D-T-S-O-N, I believe it is, Cheryl Aronson. Mm -hmm. And it might be called Autism Speaks. Um, I can uh, confirm that and circulate that information. Okay. Um, I actually, um, she's not an architect. She is a sociolo sociologist in uh, at the University of Florida. And uh, I read her book and then uh, turned it into some architectural um, pointers. And so um, the way she talks about autism is that there's a spectrum, right? A spectrum of sensitivities and there it's oral, oral auditory, it's visual, it's, it's movement, it's, it's all kinds of um, sensory um, abilities. Have, people have sensitivities where they're either, they can't stand noise or they love noise. They can't stand touch or they love to be touched. And so if we think about um, creating spaces where there are options for how to be in a room, you know, you wanna have a quiet place and you wanna have a noisy place, you wanna have a, a bright place when I have a dark place. So I think that's part of um, part of the response to it is to create um, neutral environments that people can personalize according to their own sensitivities. But I can I can also circulate that information. It's a good book. Great. Deb, there's another book that I know of. I realize this is going to be backwards, but it's uh, designing inclusive educational spaces for autism. Yeah, that's a good one. This was self-published by the Institute for Human-Centered Design. Uh, mm -hmm. Rachna Kerr is the author and she's an architect from India, but also a parent of children with autism. So she's Great. speaking from firsthand experience. Mm -hmm. what, was the, what was the author of that book again, Josh? Sorry, her name, if you can read backwards, it's Rachna Kerr. You wanna just circulate that too to the, um, to the people who were sent out the announcement for this meeting? Sure, or I can I can put it in the chat right now. Yeah, okay, good. De Deborah, I, uh, I recently have become a, a very amateur caregiver to my elderly mother. Mm, and I, mm. I have to ask the question, at what point in your conversations or does your client, do your clients come with you initially with disabilities basically to avoid crisis mode, because a lot of these things take so much time to adapt to the, the house they're in. And, mm -hmm. you're, it's, and you're right on that the solution is to stay where you're living because it's so much more healthy. Um, but I'm just wondering if someone comes to you, how do you market accessibility when they're perfectly fine <laughs> initially? And when, that's when they need to think about it, you know, because I've, I live in a neighborhood too where people are very elderly and they live by themselves and you say, oh my God, <laughs> how are they ever going to, you know, they want to stay there, but they cannot, they're, they're not, I, I, they've never worked with an architect. They don't know potentially what they do, do so or maybe not have the budget. What have you tried? How do, how, what is your conversation with your mother like about that? Have you, have you broached the subject? Uh, well, it's, you have to know my family dynamics too, but um, 
she is having problems with hearing, visibility, as well as uh, mobility. Mm -hmm. And, um, but, you know, we're going to adapt the bathrooms, but again, you know, we ideally should have done them. I guess it's my fault. <laughs> we should have done it three years ago. So, yeah. you know, I'm just looking for how do you market that or convince people when they're not impaired to go for it? Um, well, I, I can answer, but I'd like to also hear from other people. Uh, it's a hard sell. <laughs> Uh, my mother went to the basement for her laundry um, and kept her hamper on the second floor. And she was 85 years old. And I would say, mom, call me when you're going to do your laundry and call me when you finished it, because I would be so worried. I know those stairs, I grew up in that house. Um, she never did it. Uh, and I think that it's, it, first of all, it's, um, you think about resale value that everybody these days, you know, is looking at convenience and that utility rooms are um, a part of uh, the living space rather than um, relegated to the basement. Uh, when you're doing any renovations, the kitchen cabinet cabinets are getting loose. The the you know the uh, the appliances aren't working anymore. That's the time to make uh, choices that are uh, that bring the house more into um, accessibility and um, doing a bathroom remodeling. Uh, there's so much we can do. It, you know, I think that it's most magazines, media, um, a lot of websites, when they talk about what's up in bathroom design, for example, it's really all about, you know, colors and aesthetics and who's, who's what tile companies uh, are doing what with uh, texture and, and it's very easy to feel that the conversation about accessibility is not important because it's not brought into um, mainstream publications. And so I think we need to look beyond that then I, and understand the wide range of safety issues. Um, I don't know. Is, is, is that, you know, Jim, and to answer your question, it's your house. So you can do it the way you like because you're looking at aging yourself there, I imagine, right? right? So you're not doing it just for maybe. your mom. Yeah, maybe the, but the, again, given this climate right now, mm -hmm. you know, that's so difficult to get a plumber and, and the, mm -hmm. the um, so it's just, I guess I'm asking a big picture question and it's when you're having a conversation with a client, you know, they're perfectly healthy in their fifties. That's really the time they should do this, you know? And it's, yeah. and, and it's not, it, like you say, it's not an attractive design concept to talk about or set a program. Well, so, it, it can be. Yeah. That's really our, our job mm -hmm. is to, um, when I said the list of skill sets or what is uh, somewhere along one of those slides talked about communication and persuasiveness. And, no. and I think we really do need to um, understand that, that uh, we can move the dial and we need to, to understand the real concerns that people have and your mother may be feeling she doesn't want to put you out. She doesn't want you to spend the money. She doesn't want you to do anything particular for her. That, uh, and so I think we really need to understand people's, people's resistance and look at it in, in a number of different, from a number of different perspectives, resale, functionality, mm -hmm. um, aesthetics, um, cost, cost effectiveness. Mm -hmm. Thank you. I, I, and I, if I could ask a pragmatic question is, mm -hmm. what do you think about the stair lifts as an option? Um, I was just wondering if most of your, well, all your, the solutions you showed us were all single level or the promotion of single level living. But I was wondering, what are your thoughts in general about these stair lifts for, uh, you know, 
a device for our mobility. Mm. First to second floor. Well, uh, I well, a couple of the projects I showed you, they, yeah. they talked about wanting to put stair lifts in and I mm -hmm. convinced them that um, anything mechanical can break and mm -hmm. um, that's fine for people who can sit on their own, but if you need assistance or you're um, having problems with, with balance, that that might not be the most effective solution. Um, when people come to an architect, I think they're willing to um, knock down some walls and kind of rethink space in a, in a major way. Um, the ones who, who want to buy an off the shelf item don't usually just come to me. Mm -hmm. uh, Josh, do you have right. any thoughts uh, on that? Yeah, can I, can I share a photo? Yeah. I think you have to let me, or somebody has to let me. Uh, yeah. Who is doing this? As long as we're being inter interactive, I could also just speak if that's going to be too sure, complicated. We did um, we did a, a project uh, in in Metro West actually um, for a woman with MS who had had a diagnosis for thirty five years, and it was slowly progressing. Um, and over time, in a in a two story split level ranch. They had been making adaptations and adaptations and adaptations, but so this was a house with four different half flight, you know, sets of stairs. Um, mm -hmm. And oh, thanks, Alex. And so, you know, this is what they were dealing with. I mean, you think about the challenge here is that she mm -hmm. had she had a scooter on each half level of the house, either a scooter or a chair, because oh these God. stair chairs only. And so they finally, you know, they. They finally said, "Enough is enough. We need a, you know, we need an in-home elevator." And it was just, you know, finding the right place to, to do it. But I do think the stair chairs are problematic for lots of reasons, including they don't provide the kind of flexibility. You know, there's a limit at which point they're no longer helpful to a lot of um, mobility profiles. Whereas something like a platform lift or an elevator um, is much more adaptable. Mm -hmm. um Usually people, I, I think when people come to me is when they have a lot of clutter in their house with all of this off the shelf stuff, right? And at a certain point you can make improvements with um, you know, a, a, something that attaches to your doorknob so that it turns it into a lever and you can, you can get uh, extra storage in the bathroom to put um, uh, nursing supplies in and, and, but then when the house starts to get filled with, with all this stuff, then I think it's time to say, okay, let's, let's do some construction. I have a question, Deborah. Yeah. Um, we have a client in our office now who is preparing to age in place apartment for her parents. And uh, I'm having trouble sourcing uh, I would say beautiful, but I'd just be happy with normal looking vanities and uh, faucets and things. For example, the father uh, expects to be needing to wash out a bedpan. And, and for that, he, in his Florida home, uses a kitchen sink with a sprayer. But Ooh. if you put that on a vanity sink, you end up with spray all over your front. So they want now a mini kitchen sink in their bathroom and everything is getting really wonky and ugly. Um, and every time I try to Google or go to any of our showrooms, I get no help. So I'm, I'm, uh, am I asking you very specifically, where do you find this stuff? Mm, mm -mm. Um, well, any, I look everywhere I can. I'll, I'll go to um, cabinet shops and just poke around and see what they have. Look online, uh, spend a lot more time than, than I used to you know, looking for the right product. Uh, Google makes it easier. Um, look on house.com and see what people are doing. Just say like big bathroom sinks. Um, you know, why not make a, a, like a slop sink or a shower that's uh, a hand shower fairly low and create a place in the bathroom for rinsing that out. Um, it doesn't have to be in the sink. And um, uh, yeah, I, I think one of the skill sets of, of architects, I, and I say patience, it's, it's patience with the client's time making decisions about things like that, but it's also with ourselves. But I think we have to give 
um, a little extra time for, for uh, finding the right product, for bringing them along, that this is the right thing to use, for finding who's, who supplies it, where can you get it, what's a good price. Um, sometimes also uh, you can find things with, uh, you know, Restore, which is a uh, recycle uh, store that Habitat for Humanity uh, operates. There's one in Dedham and uh, oftentimes we can, this is not particularly to your question, Eve, but it's, it's part of the resources, I think, for architects is to understand what's, what resources there are out there. People with disabilities may not have the budget, um, may not have a, um, be able to work. And so the, the, for us, finding things that are less expensive that will do the job uh, is also part of our, our skill set. Um, Deborah, can I ask a question? Um, another Deborah. Yeah, hi. Any... <laughs> hi. So, um, so I have several clients who are aging in place and um, that I've come up with solutions for. And um, so I want to talk about fees. You've, you've so several of us have talked about money and I think a lot of us are, I'm not really sure the composition of this group, but I know several of us are single practitioners like myself. So anyway, in, in any case, um, this requiring patience and extra time and extra research requires extra billing time. And sometimes clients don't understand that. I, I'm just wondering if you or others might have some insight into that because it, on one hand you're talking about people with limited income and then on the other hand wanting to renovate their whole house and so I've had pushback about me doing you know extensive research or um, five different alternative locations for a, a first floor bedroom when they don't want to pay for the architectural fees so anyway just oh, putting it out there. I'm so glad you mentioned that that is the really the elephant in the room isn't it? Uh, uh, I'd say uh, it may be that we need to chalk, chalk up some of our research time to overhead, first of all. You know, where, where's the line between what you can charge your client and what you're doing, you know, consider you're getting a master's, you know, in accessible architecture and you're taking a course here. Um, so I've, I've changed the way I work in some regards that I, um, will not do tasks. I used to do schematics on an hourly basis and design development on an hourly basis. And so the costs would sometimes get fairly high. The client changes their mind about what to do. And okay, well, you know, that's a new design. We got to go back to the beginning. Um, now I, I, I feel that it's partly because I have enough experience under my belt, but I, uh, will say lump sum. And that way, uh, it, it kind of takes us all off the hook to be watching the time clock. Um, I wish that there were an organization and I feel that you know maybe this group might be a way to um, get it going that, that obtains some grant money that, um, creates an organization where people can get financial assistance. There is something called the Mass, mass Home Modification, uh, let's see, Mass Home Home Modification Loan Program, I believe it's called. And um, people can get um, financial assistance for their projects. So I think part of our resources as architects is to understand um, where they might be able to look for grant money, you know, uh, rebates on mechanical equipment um, and appliances uh, to talk to them really bring that conversation about money in early onto the, into the process. Um, certain disabilities may qualify for certain funding. Um, check out um, what might be available for Parkin people with Parkinson's or MS or other uh, disabling, disabling conditions. Um, and and I think it's also really important to, um, as I said earlier, I think have, have understanding of where people might get things themselves, for instance, to save the, the builder's markup. And 
So it's a slightly different way, I think, of, of working. Uh, you can't assume that the, the clients have a lot of, have endless resources or, or at least optimum resources and bring those conversations about money in um, up front. Anyone else want to add to that? One, one thing, sort of one lesson that I've learned from my first a uh, really wonderful project with an older couple who um, she has Alzheimer's as well as physical disabilities. And so he was her solitary um, caregiver. And I found that I, a lot of the research for um, things that the, the builder just didn't want to find, say, a hospital quality shower curtain rod that would go mm -hmm. on and a slope ceiling. So I had to, I mean, there were just a lot of, um, of materials that I ended up sourcing that I didn't expect to. And for this project, I had no markup at all. But I think um, if you anticipate that you're going to be doing a lot of the sourcing for specialty items, um, you can say, okay, the builder may mark this up his 18%, I'll mark it up 10%. And it does help to cover. I didn't do it this first one, but I, I will in the future. Just the procurement can be an opportunity. So, mm -hmm. yeah, that's a good point. It, does anybody have any projects yeah. that they would like to share that you're working on? I don't have a project to share, and I have done a couple of, um, first of all, also ADA commercial projects, but also residential aging in, in place. And I do have, uh, or we did have clients, they basically come and say in their 60s or some, even if they don't have the disability, they say, we know we are we're going to stay here in that house. And then we are going to, if we do a renovation, we go that that path of aging in place. So we, this is really a trend we, we can see. And I think that's great. Um, to the comment of what Eve had, uh, I had the same thing, like uh, simple grab bars to find which look not commercial, not hospital style but then don't look flimsy so if you look at this if they are not ADA approved then and you look at them they look great but then you think oh my god someone is, is grabbing them and it, it's it's not going to hold up uh, finding finding resourcing is really a big uh, big issue and I was wondering if there are any libraries yet started on kind of resources compilation um, what, what architects, not only in this group, but more on the AIA level, BSA level, uh, share or through the through groups like uh, uh, disability groups or something like that. If you know of any, uh, uh, Reed, are you are you familiar with uh, human centered design? Yes, yes, a little yeah. bit, a little um, bit, yes. They sometimes have a good resource library. Mm -hmm, mm -hmm. Okay. I think also products change a lot frequently. Um, That's you know, true. There's always, there's always new things on the market and uh, looking at what are, what's going on in other countries sometimes um, can be useful. Um, there's, a, there's a really great um, trade show called Batimat in Paris every two years. Um, in November, and uh, it's just like um, ABX on steroids in terms of it's many, many buildings, many, um, one will be devoted to a commercial and another one might be devoted towards um, like roofing and waterproofing and another one might be residential and it's, um, it's a good resource. Uh, we also should know that some things can't, and they, they might give us ideas of even if the product's not available in this country, um, something I've run into is that uh, sinks from Ikea are not on the list of approved sinks for the mass plumbing code. And so um, that's something, you know, since we're often specifying bathroom plumbing fixtures that uh, we should know if we call for a certain sink from Ikea because it's cheap and maybe it's nice, um, can't use it. Right. Deborah, I have a question. Um, in your experience, has there been um, any particular arrangement or dimensional uh, 
change that you've made that's sort of above and beyond the code that has been sort of most valuable to your clients? Um, I think that I ha half of my um, knowledge kind of um, base is from the codes and half of it comes from the client. And so even with the code that it's important to um, confirm all the details with the client. Uh, so oftentimes I'll measure the client, you know, how high can you reach? What's comfortable? What can you, um, what's a good height for a seat? Mock things up, um, bring a tape to a, me to a meeting. Uh, there's a couple of uh, diagrams in, I think, um, ADA online that will show you all the things that need to be measured. Um, what's, a, what's a good reach if you're reaching over something, if you're reaching forward, if you're reaching to the side. Uh, and I think of that as a checklist. And then I'll, I'll uh, can't really ask your clients to measure things. Every time I've done right. that, particularly in COVID, you know, I've asked people, could you just measure your father and, and come, come back to me with these numbers? They don't know what to measure, they, they get it wrong. Um, being off by a half an inch could be the difference between having a, a sink that you can use in a, in a vanity with a, with a wheelchair or not. So those right. tolerances are really important to get right. And I think we have to do it ourselves. But does that super customization end up um, conflicting with resale at times? I mean. That's our job, right? Yeah. <laughs> um, Sometimes it might. Um, you th think about adaptability. The, the code allows you to um, create environments that are can be easily changed. So that might mean that um, the specialized sink that somebody needs for, or a cabinet that somebody needs in vanity or in a kitchen, um, make it a, a unit width that can be substituted uh, with the floor going underneath it so that if you need to take it out or add it back in, it's not going to require that somebody redo the whole space mm -hmm. might mean that the floor goes the floor tile goes in under the cabinets right. for example and that gives you flexibility of taking the cabinets out later or if you're putting an accessible unit in um, same thing think about the, the width of a wheelchair and the um, the storage capacity being able to function well with and without that cabinet in place. Mm -hmm. You know, I gotta say it's it's hard, it's hard work and it's really interesting work um, because the um, so much needs needs to kind of be our, all of our assumptions need to be challenged. You know, can you just use such and such a sink? Well, is it shallow? Where's the drain? Can the p p trap be put towards the back and, and maintain? knee space in front of it. Um, what's the what's the spout um, height and what's the um, the angle of the water coming out of the overhead shower? And you know, we really we really need to think about all of that, that just making a, a bigger shower or a um, better looking uh, faucet, you know, might isn't the only criteria. It's not just aesthetic. Right. Right. Anybody else? I welcome if people are um, interested in this topic uh, to reach out to me and, you know, let's, let's, uh, whether there's a subgroup of this or whether there's a, a follow up among the people that are present here today, I'd be interested in hearing, seeing the projects that you all are doing. Um, and, uh, also to know if I were referring projects and clients to, to other people, uh, what are your specialties? Where do, you, where do you work? Where are you located? Um, what kinds of projects have you done that are similar? And maybe if we were all sitting in place in the same room and we've got five more minutes here, uh, just a quick show of hands or maybe just do your, um, the hand icon. Uh, do you, how many people, want to get more into this kind of work or already do it? Kind of already do. Okay. Um, 
so that's a pretty good number. Um, maybe we can we can follow up with a, another meetings, particularly on this topic. Okay. You know, do a little more sharing. I'd like to see what you're all doing. Deb, I'd just like to add too, and my yeah. my co-chair from the Access Committee, Ian Baldwin, is also on the call. He's the funny looking guy with the gray the gray head there. <laughs> His face isn't here. It's just a, a, an icon. But um, sorry, Ian. Um, we have certainly taken on topics like this through the Access Committee as well. Mm -hmm. And if there was interest in organizing, um, you know, uh, organizing a, a session on, you know, universal residential design with a few different you know, architects or designers or something like that, um, we'd be interested in, in doing it. Great, great, me too. Let's talk again, Josh. Super. Ian, Ian says he's in the quiet car. <laughs> <laughs> um, I, I want to um, point out to whoever is interested or, um, I don't know, available. At, well, I, I live in, in Wellesley and Wellesley is building two new elementary schools right now. and all of the elementary schools in Wellesley have um, have specialized programs for um, students with various learning issues and behavioral issues. I know this isn't residential, but anyway, there's been talk in the, at the school committee about hiring consultants to um, assist the architects, it, unless the architects are, are already skilled in those areas. But it's just, it's something that, that is being discussed now in two major projects in Wellesley. So if anyone is interested in that, they might want to know. I think about that's, those. that's one of the things when I, when I said kind of, um, how, how can you develop um, sensitivity to these issues is to really track that. And even though it's uh, educational space and it's, it's commercial, or it's non-residential anyhow, um, it's institutional. Uh, I think there's there's a lot we can learn if you know you see what are they, how are they thinking, how are the architects thinking about these issues? What are they doing in terms of acoustics for for uh, to make it easier for for kids who have hearing disabilities or hearing loss or or to um, are they looking at these sensitivities for vision and hearing and cognitive. Uh, impairment and focus and and um, that we really have to read between the lines, I think, and we'll find that there are a lot of answers out there that in ways that I think we can increase our knowledge base. Absolutely. I'll just remind everybody before we sign off, not to not to end the conversation, but just to remind you if you want credit to please click on the link in the chat. Uh, to sign up to let you know you can get your credit. Great. Thank you, everybody. Thank you so much, Deborah. Okay. Bye bye. Thank you.